Good evening, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is a nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books. And Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We are here tonight to celebrate archiving Mexican masculinities and diaspora at Keras. <clears throat> we are delighted to be here with all of you virtually and in person with Dr. Nicole M. Yavati Hernandez, who is a professor of English at Emory University on fellowship at Harvard's Charles Warren Center for American History during the academic year 2019-2020. She was a faculty member at UT Austin from 2012 to 2019 and the inaugural chair of the Department of Mexican American and Latino Latino Studies. She started her academic career at the University of Arizona from 2003 to 2011. Her book titled Unspeakable Violence, Remapping U.S. and Mexican National Imaginaries from Duke University Press, was a finalist for the 2012 Berkshire Women's History First Book Prize and won the MLA Chicana, Chicano, and Latina Latino Prize in Literary and Cultural Studies for 2012. The book has received many favorable reviews. Her second book, which we are celebrating tonight, was awarded a silver medal for the Mimi Lorenzo Family History Prize by the International Latino Book Awards. As a public intellectual, she has written numerous articles for the feminist magazine Biz and the feminist blog The Feminist Wire, covering such topics as immigration, reproductive rights, and the DREAM Act. She also sits on the National Advisory Council for Miz and is currently on the National Advisory Council for Freedom University in Atlanta, Georgia. So welcome. We're so glad you're here and so honored to celebrate your book with you. And we're joined by our friend Lauren Klein, who is a Winship Distinguished Research Professor and Associate Professor in the Departments of English and Quantitative Theory and Methods at Emory University, where she also directs the Digital Humanities Club. She is the author of An Archive of Taste, Race, and Eating in the Early United States, and with Catherine Ignazio, Data Feminism, um, which is a book uh, that we got to celebrate early in the pandemic, and you can check out on our archive um, on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com backslash With Matthew K. Gold, she edits Debates in the Digital Humanities, a hybrid print digital publication stream that explores debates in the field as they emerge. So we want to encourage our friends watching at home virtually to pop questions into the chat at any time and our friends here in the room to ask questions towards the end. We'll be passing around the mic and um, I think we're just going to get right into it. So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. I just can I just I just want to thank the Kara Circle for having us and for me, this is really lovely because I want to shout out the other feminist bookstores that I've had relationships with over the years. Antigone Bookstore in Tucson, Arizona, who had me on their bestseller list, which is really fun and exciting as a first time author and uh, Latinx feminist. And also the Book Woman Bookstore in Austin, Texas, who hosted a reading for my, uh, my first book as well. And I also just want to shout out my Ms. colleagues because we're Karis, Bookwoman, Ms., uh, Antigone, we're all in this together, and feminist bookstores are surviving. We need them now more than ever in this post war world moment, and so I just want to thank you for having us um, because uh, you are the heart of the community. So thank you, that national community, thank you. As, especially as we lead up to this election. Right, so thanks. <laughs> And I'll just, I'll just uh, add to that praise and appreciation for Kara. So I'll say Kara was actually one of the first public events that I ever attended when I moved to Atlanta. An old colleague of mine, former Kara Circle board member, was like, hey, you should come to this event. It's actually, it was a, I think it was a kind of feminist collective, early pre-book gathering. And I it was in the old location in Little Five. And I got there and we were transported to this magical place that I hadn't yet seen in Atlanta. And it was one of the first signs that Atlanta could be a home for me, so Karis is also near and dear to my heart. Um, so I want to sort of redirect uh, <laughs> the praise uh, from Karis and this amazing uh, environment and setting for this conversation to Dr. Budoni Hernandez for writing this amazing book. Um, you know, one of the really interesting things that I was thinking about when reading it is that it's so specific, it's so grounded in these specific 
um, examples of these two particular settings. And I think because of that, it sort of masks the fact that it requires so much knowledge and expertise in order to put together, right? So you had to know the very local histories of two specific moments in time, of two countries, of two regions of particular countries. Um, you had to be able to make connections across decades, across different social movements. Um, you had to be able to bring feminist, black feminist, queer theoretic lenses to bear on these particular places and these particular events. Um, then there's like the actual archival research, like the, the in the archives, the sleuthing and the going through the papers. Um, and then the archival theory that sort of prompted you to go look for these artifacts in the first place. And, you know, and then also like your own history that uh, inter yeah. sort of shows up here and there, especially in the final pages. And to me, thinking about that work, it's not surprising to me, um, knowing that you and your scholarship, but it is, I think, worth making explicit because it's, you know, you only know that if you know, right? You only know that having read the book and having come to the conclusions of the arguments, and it's just such an amazing feat. Um, and by way of context, I feel like I should have maybe started here. So um, Nicole and I co-taught a class last semester, two semesters ago, I don't know, COVID times. Um, last spring. Last spring. Yeah, it feels like it's a blur, but yeah, last spring. Um, whatever it was. And it was about feminist approaches to race and archives. Yeah. And it brought together a lot of our shared interest, which um, immediately we read Nicole's first book in that class and not this one. Um, so it was nice also to read this again with the, the prior knowledge of um, the work that you've done to bring us to this point. So anyway, so that's actually where I wanted to start. Okay. Um, I wanted to start just by asking you, you know, given your range of expertise, the various types of work that you've done in the past, um, you know, can you talk a little bit just what brought you to this project? If you had an sort of initial motivating question that took you to this material, you know, how did it evolve, how did it change? Yeah, so I often do things from a place of frustration, and I know I've said this to you before, but I was really exhausted by nationalist accounts of masculinity in Mexican-American, Chicano, Chicana, and Latinx studies in their uh, unwillingness to recognize the way that gender and sexual practice shift based on context, right? As if some, I, there's a line in the book where I say something like, um, as if when people magically cross the U.S.-Mexico border, right, their gender and sexual position doesn't change, right? And I was puzzled by that. I was frustrated by that. Um, I was working in all of these archives about uh, insurgency movements in Mexico uh, for, for indigenous people, Yaqui peoples in the late 19th, early 20th century. And then I ran into these archives about anarchists because they were both being policed in the same way. And what I found fascinating is the material about indigenous people was all about race. And the material about these anarchists was all about masculinity. And there was this discrete shift like in the way that they were these communities were being talked about as a problem to the nation. Um, but in the discussion of these anarchists, it was very much in the vein of a normative, hetero, in Mexico, they say fuerte, feo y formal, right? Ugly, formal, and strong masculinity that gets narrated through these uh, government documents um, that was really at odds with what I had read in private correspondence and seen in photographs of these Mexican migrant cohorts, the anarchists in the 19, uh, the teens and the 20s, and then braceros in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and so there was a real disconnect between sort of what people want us to believe about these folks versus who they actually were in their messy daily lives. Um, and that's how I got to affect as a category and through, and through queer studies and feminist studies, um, which is to say like, how can we think about emotion as a form of tracking history? How can we think about emotion as a form of tracking the way people respond and make make themselves into something and how does that border crossing not just be a form of magic and liberation but how is it also an opportunity to remake oneself and or maintain the gender privileges and practices that one had in mexico right as a uh, cis presenting man mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so 
I was interested in the messy stuff and was like, it's not, this is a disaster. It's not simple. Like, let's pull apart this category of masculinity. Let's pull apart this like exhausting and old discourse of machismo and look at like what's underneath it, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, it's such a testament to your book and to your analysis that the possibility that there might be a unit, like that machismo might hold up, that there might be a unitary conception right. of masculinity, it's like not even a possibility almost as soon as you start writing, yeah. right? You know, and so as someone, for my perspective, someone who is less well-versed in the scholarship on Mexico and machismo, you know, not, I mean, I know a general sense of things, sure. but, you know, I was with you from page one, okay. right? And I yeah. think that that's, you know, again, given that you are actually pushing back against the dominant narrative, it is, again, just a real testament to your work and to your writing. I sort of wanted to come back to the mess though, because I, I feel like this is both important and also a thing that people who don't do archival work don't know about, which is what archival work actually means and looks like. Yeah. And I think when people think about it, they think about, you know, like stuffy environments with like red velvet and you have to wear white gloves and people <laughs> shush you, which is actually true for some archives, right? Well, maybe yeah. but that's I have a good story about that. Um, but other times it looks like, you know, like poking through an attic and there's like you're like coughing about over the dust and you like unearth bug carcasses and stuff like that. So I and because the artifacts that you treat in this book are so, so compelling and rich and unique, like I wanted to hear more about that. You know, where were the art like where did you have this initial realization about the difference in characterization of the Yaki versus the anarchist. Like, where were you? What documents were you looking at? What was the environment like? Were you wearing gloves? Like, tell us, <laughs> sure. tell us about where you went, what you found. So I was in cell block number five in the old Penitenciaria Nacional in the Barrio San Lazaro so in Mexico so. City, <laughs> where they held the prisoners of Plata Loco, the students that were taken in the massacre in 1969 and held in those prison cells. And so the Galeria Cinco, which is where I did my work, was the early 20th century archive. And there are seven galleries. And I have a gallery, I, what you said about like, you know, what is it like? So the gringos that used to work in the colonial Mexican archive, which is Galeria Uno, were playing their music too loud. And so after that point, like nobody could play music in the archives and you couldn't even use earbuds because you had to be silenced. So right there, like that tells you like there's a there are different attitudes about like, okay, we're in a prison. The prison was constructed by Porfirio Diaz, the dictator who I wrote about in my first book, who sets the tone for thinking about masculinity and these counter narratives of masculinity in my second book. So I'm in that prison in the Galleria, it's a panopticon. So it's a totally like an actual, it actual, it's like you walk into the, the prison and you get past security and there's a rotunda in the middle and then all the Galerias go out like a spoke of the wheel, right? And the guard tower was in the middle and then there's observation decks around in a spiral so that you can look in, plus observation decks on the walls inside the Galerias. And so the documents are held in the cells the same cells where the prisoners, you know, were kept, right, during that Plata Loco incident at the Plaza de Tres Culturas back in 1969, leading up to the Olympics. So that's where I was. You have to wear gloves, you have to wear cubierta bocas, which now the, the term is mascarillas because of the pandemic, so it's become like different from something else. Um, and you can only request 10 folders at a time. They're super uh, strict about that. Um, if they see you taking off their gloves, they threaten to kick you out. Um, you have to ask permission to go to the restroom because things have disappeared. But what's interesting is that people have stolen materials, but also like, for example, the archives about the Plata local prisoners, a friend of mine who's a provost at, I think, Oakland University now, and Lady Carey talks about how uh, her documents, she went and looked at some boxes one day and then came back to look at them and they were gone because the government realized that they shouldn't have been releasing the documents. So we have disappearing prisoners, disappearing files, we have a prison, we have a panopticon, you know, we have like, you know, a century of dust, we have, you know, a haunted space. You can feel, you can feel death in the space. It's, it's, it's pretty wild. And then I'm reading about indigenous genocide alongside the persecution of anarchists. And so, 
it all made sense to me though, because of course that's the way that like Mexican history works, which is it's all of these layers. And I suspect underneath the prison is probably some kind of religious site because that's, you know, that palimpsestic nature of building and covering up and building and covering up and, and thinking about unearthing history and thinking about like, that space was not a co-ed a co prison until the 1960s, it was a men's prison. Um, it makes perfect sense that the work was done there and the, the epiphany moment about the connection between these two uh, archives of um, political dissent happened in that context, in that space, in that moment. Yeah, so, and then, you know, just like the limits on what you can look at. And I remember one time I was getting ready to finish up my my Fulbright and you know thank you to the Fulbright Foundation for giving me the capacity to go and do this work um, at that archive, the Archivo Porfirio Diaz of the Universidad Iberoamericana and the Secretaria de Relaciones Exteriores, which is in Puerto Loco, interestingly enough, um, is that uh, you know I, I'm doing this work in all of these different sites and. I'm piecing the puzzle together, right? Which is, okay, so there's certain doc kinds of documents in this one archive. There's official State Department stuff in this other. There's Porfirio Diaz's private musings about all this stuff. And each group of people is being very protective and they create ways for you to not get access because that's their, their job. And so you can only get photocopies, for example, at the AGN on Thursdays. And I remember trying to leave the archive, like getting ready to come back to the States. And was like, I need to get these photocopies. And they're like, que no hay photocopiadores hoy, which means like, there's not photocopiers today. And I was like, pero ya está la máquina. The, the machine is over there. And they're like, no, pero la persona. And I'm like, que persona, hay una máquina, <laughs> right? And, they're, and there's no, es que hay una persona que solo trabaja en fotocopias. Y si no está, tú no puedes recibir tus fotocopias, mm -hmm. right? So it, this bureaucracy, right? About, but it's also about Mexican unemployment. Like we have to hire somebody, right? To have a job to just see photocopies they're only here on Thursdays. Right, so it's this like commentary on structural inequality at the same time about like, you know, preventing access because they don't want this stuff flying all over. And of course they don't, right? I mean, because they want people that books to come to the archive and don't commission by hands. Um, you know, so there are these really weird spaces and having access in Latin America is really different than like going to the Rose Library in, in Emory where people are like falling over backwards to help you. Like it's, it's challenging if you don't know the language, if you don't know the customs, if you don't know like social norms. They can be like, you don't have a letter of presentation, we're not letting you in, bye. Right? And so there are just all these like additional hurdles to getting access to the information. Um, but once you're in, it's marvelous. And so the, you know, like the walls of the prison remind you of like why you're there, if that makes sense. Right. And the documents shouldn't be held captive. Um, I need to free them. <laughs> well, this, this is like <laughs> Derrida could not have conjured an archive no. and adhered more to It's a wild place. Yeah. I encourage everyone to go to San Lazaro and the Bakken. Um, <laughs> wow, that, I, I have not heard that. that. That's an amazing story. I mean, I, so one thing that I actually think is sort of, also to sort of like level setting here, I think is really important to talk about are the individual artifacts themselves, sure. which I think also are unexpected given your training as a literary scholar, sure. a literary historian, one would think that where you go is textual documents, right? right? But many of the documents that you treat in the book are not textual, they're visual, they're photographic, they have to they were what archival people call like ephemera, right? Um, and so I was just wondering if you could talk about some of the individual examples of those artifacts that are most meaningful or were most generative for you in terms of sort of laying out or helping to establish your thinking? Sure. Um, so I'll start with the set of documents that kind of pushed me into the project, which is I came across all of these um, code translations in the AGN um, of the, the, the code that the PLM was writing in. And there was this debate back and forth between all these government officials about what codes they were using and how to break the codes. Um, and to me, it was interesting because 
I was like, oh, this is about language. And there is a lack of capacity to understand the way that this different form of language is working and they're debating about it. And so in a military communique like that, I treat it as a literary text, which is I look, I don't just look at what it's about. I look at the form and composition and content. And so I take that literary training and literally apply it to whatever I'm looking at. So if it's a photograph, I'm going to close read the like the cover image. Like one of the things that I and I didn't pick this by the way. Um, I'm going to just hold it up because I, I think it's such a beautiful cover um, of these gentlemen um, in a uh, a labor camp in the Salinas Valley in 1956 in the letter of Nadal um, sequence. And what I like about it is it it. It's a wrap shot, it's framed, right? We have a, a gentleman lounging in front, and then we have three men kind of looking in as if they're almost, um, they're like photobombing, right? Two for sure, one is looking down and writing. There's a staged quality to this image, right? But there's also a very intentional way that leisure is being signaled that um, material excesses of the 1950s in terms of grooming products are here and present, and I, and, but also representing literacy. And I do a full scale reading of this picture because in lieu of these gentlemen, I mean, and Nadal doesn't tell us who they are. There's no records of their names or anything. In lieu of not knowing who they are, what can we glean about their existence? What can we glean about the return of the look, the comfort of the gaze with the hand gently resting, you know, on what uh, Susanna Chavez Silverman calls the torrid zone, right? This reclining leisure, uh, capacity to be consumers. There's so much packed into this image, which is why I love it for the book uh, cover, because it, it does the labor of explaining um, how these men are seeing themselves in relationship to camera, how they're in community, how they're separated right, by walls, but how they're conjoined by their experience as braceros, as migrant workers, as Mexican nationals, right, and how they form a community, a, a home social community. Um, so I, I think about documents like this or, or photographs like this um, as another form of text that we can close read. And I think that's where the training thing is, it, it, it really shows itself, which is I take every document, every line, every image, every code translation, um, every poem, every newspaper article, even if it's you know, like a throwaway line, because we have so little evidence about the lives of these individuals and also their communal circles, whether we're talking about, you know, interacting with prostitutes at dances in places like Watsonville and San Juan Batista and labor camps, interacting with church priests and labor camps in Soledad, California, um, you know, having multiple affairs with multiple women in the commune in Edenvale, uh, uh, California in the early teens, um, you know, women who are having multiple sexual partners in this rhetoric of free love of the PLM and yet chastising and punishing those same women for engaging in the same practices as men, right? Those throwaway lines about those people actually become really meaningful in tethering together this narrative about how normative Mexican masculinity comes undone when we pay attention to the throwaway, when we pay attention to the started, when we pay attention to the photo and treat it as seriously as we would treat a presidential address by Ulysses S. Grant, like after the Civil War is over. Mm -hmm. And I'm teaching a Civil War memoir right now, which is why I brought that up. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not me being weird, it's because <laughs> that's where I'm, the other place I'm living right now intellectually. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, so in one of the, in one of the, benefits of that approach, I think, is that it really enables you to tell, uh, I would say like a full story, but a much more complete story than you would otherwise if you didn't subject these documents to this incredibly intense analysis. And one of the amazing things as a reader is that, you know, once again, it's like, I didn't know that these were undertold stories that we didn't know about these particular lives, or in the case of the Megon brothers, they're the two wives of Enrique, right? Like, yeah, you know, it, because you were able to tell this really rich and complicated story about these, in the, that particular case, these two women whose lives had been forgotten from sort of the dominant histories, um, you know, it, it was, to me, it was like uh, proof through the telling that these methods, like these are the methods of these documents required, right? Yeah. Um, so I think maybe one of the things that um, 
feel like we could go, there's so many different directions we could go at this point. Do you want to talk a little bit about um, Paola and Teresa, or do you want to talk a little bit about more about method? What do you, where do you want to go? Well, that? I think we can talk about Paola Carmona and Teresa Teaga as a way to talk about method, um, because what do you do when you don't have documents authored by people, right? What do you do when you don't have like an official archive about folks that you know existed um, that are clearly central to these narratives and, and, and you know that something is not right and I'll, and I'll use the metaphor that, that I, I used in another context, which is que no cuadra, it doesn't swear up. And one of the things that I noticed in my research about Rita Flores Magón is that there was this mentioning of Paula Carmona randomly here and there, like, you know, oh, she was his first wife and she died. Oh, uh, you know, she betrayed him. Like these, you know, again, the throwaway, right? These small references. And they didn't make sense to me, right? And we had official his I had official histories from the Mexican government say, oh, she died in 1914. Well, then I, you know, when looked at the census data and you no, know, she she was alive and well and had two children living with her parents in San Fernando Street in Los Angeles. Uh, so that was not true. And then for me, right, then it became this question of, okay, so Paula Carmona was alive and not dead. Why were people saying she was dead, right, as Enrique's first wife? And then, um, but why were people saying that Teresa Arteaga was his legitimate public wife in the same year, in 1914. It didn't make sense to me. And then I basically had to go back and find any shred of evidence about both of them that I possibly could to piece together a narrative. And so while the through line on the lives of all these men in this anarchist cell is, you know, there are thousands of books about Ricardo Flores Magón. Uh, Kelly Lytle Hernandez just published a book called Bad Mexicans, which is about the PLM. But it's interesting when she, talks about the relationships with these women she uses my book because it's the only thing that like provides a narrative through line about the women that were involved as intimate partners and also as political actors in this movement and so i think that teresa and paula paula's erasure and teresa's um teresa's emergence as this revolutionary mother um are really emblematic of the way that we can get at people's marginal histories through the documents of people that over occupy the narrative, right? In other words, like there are tens of thousands of documents in Enrique Flores Magón's archive, but if we look closely, they're not just about him. They're, and how can we suss out the stories of these other folks, right? Of Juan Abelén uh, uh, Gutierrez, who was ousted with uh, Elisa Cunha. Uh, for being lesbians and for portraying the movement and putting their sexuality above the priorities of the PLM, right? When these men were going out and having multiple relationships, engaging in free love, and it didn't matter. But the minute two women, you know, betray them, then they're lesbians. And then whether they're lesbians or not doesn't matter, right? Because it's about the movement and upholding this masculine idea of patriarchy. Mm -hmm. um, and so to get to the methodological question, right? We can use the, the the documents and the archives of of the figure that dominates the history to get at the micro history. And so I tell the story backwards, right? Through Enrique, the story is about Enrique, but all of the other people that make up his life world, that make up the mess of his intimate world, that make up the mess of his familial life, um, because it shows that these people are totally flawed and that humans are flawed, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you a question that I think I, sorry, it's a leading question. Um, but, you know, one of the things that comes out throughout the book is your claim that this is a feminist project, right? Yeah. Um, and yet it's a book about masculine sure. women with men at the center. Yeah. Right. And so I'm curious to know how sort of yeah. both what feminist methods and how feminist methods enable you to tell this story or how does i guess maybe to ask the question a little bit of, of a simpler way it's like how do you square feminism with the types of questions that this book is engaging yeah and i think mean, the answer is like very easily right but i want you to say it in more than two words <laughs> yeah of course um so for me 
the feminist method that has always driven my work is standpoint epistemology, which is that we have to articulate the position that we're coming from as a scholar and reveal those biases, right? So one of the things that I do, I don't necessarily do it. I do this about my method in the beginning of the book, which is I say, look, I am from a community where Brasetos were, I have, you know, I'm motivated by the fact that I knew nothing about this history. I'm also motivated by the fact that I think that like normative Mexican gender politics are, you know, homophobic, uh, more elastic than they present themselves as, um, and invested in patriarchy in ways that are insufferable at times, right? And that's my motivation for writing the book. And so in articulating that position through feminist, feminist standpoint epistemology, I set the table for not removing myself from the text, but rather saying that everything is subjective. And this is what I always tell my students. Nothing is subjective. Everything is subjective. Like numbers are subjective, right? Even though, you know, you're a data scientist, you know, of, 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 of uh, the digital world. I mean, this is, these are conversations that you take on in your work as well. And so by locating and implicating myself in those power dynamics, I am very much mirroring the work of the feminist scholars that I read in graduate school, which is we can't divorce ourselves from the work, we can't divorce ourselves from the text, and we can be accountable, not just to those for whom we're engaging with black narrative stories, et cetera, right? But that the gender, race, sexuality, nation analysis is also part and parcel, that intersectionality is part and parcel of the standpoint method. Right. And so even though I don't come out and say like I'm a feminist standpoint epistemologist, that drives you do have the I do. <laughs> it drives everything I do. That's like the big reveal. Right. And <laughs> if you if you don't if you don't know what it is, that's a big reveal. But if you know what that is, like the way that I'm signaling my feminism is through intersectional analysis, through implicating myself in the text, and through implicating myself in the power relations and what it means to tell a story, and also the way that I'm taking on patriarchy. Because the critique of patriarchy throughout this book is, I can, I, masculinity is about patriarchy, and my whole thing is like, let's expose it, like, let's rip the seams out of it, like, let's show you, let's show what patriarchy really is and does and how it hurts people, how it hurts men, how it hurts women, how it hurts children, how it hurts queer folks. Uh, you know, like, I just, I think that that critique of patriarchy, that's how you could do a feminist history of masculinity, right, is that you're ripping patriarchy out by the seams and saying, here's what it is, here's what it's doing, here's all these subtle instances where it's taking place in the way these families or sexual practices are being monitored, both within a supposed liberal structure and then by multiple nations and INS, which is now ICE, right, and all these structural levels of policing. Mm -hmm. So I would say, like, patriarchy is the one word answer to your my two word question. question. <laughs> and, um, but I feel like you know, there's also like there's another another component too, which goes back to your comment that like you just knew it didn't square, and it's like yeah. when you reveal the seams of patriarchy, when you expose it, what is of course revealed is multiple forms of labor that are propping up yeah. a single oh, sort yeah. of dominant male figure in the, any particular narrative. What is revealed are multiple kinship structures, yeah. the power of collectivity. Like, like it's like you also know what you will find when you remove, when you expose the patriarchy and look for it, how other people are getting by within this oppressive structure. And that's another thing that I think is, you do really beautifully through these close readings of these documents, because you get both, right? And oftentimes, like, in, you know, one after another, right? You right. get these claims of machismo, of bravura, of you talk a lot about the Baroque language and things yeah. like that, and then you also get intense emotion right. and um, feelings of, well, now we would say anxiety, but it's like yeah. more like emotional yeah. Uh, yeah. confusion and complexity yeah. and things like this. Um, I know one of the things that we wanted to talk about was this poem, which is a real sort of hinge in your book and moving, talking about Enrique and his move from Paola to, to Teresa and how he navigates or justifies or maybe knows that he cannot justify yeah. um, the, his sort of change and partner. Yeah. Um, and so do you want to just talk about that a little bit more? 
Yeah. Is it okay if I read it? Sure, sure, cool? sure, sure. Okay, so for those in the home audience, um, if you have the book, I'm on page 98. And so this is a translation that I did of a poem that I found sandwiched in a five-page letter. It's supposed to be a, like, some people describe it as a love letter, but it's an apology, not apology letter. <laughs> right? And so, like, that tells you a lot right there. Like, sorry, not sorry. Okay? And so in the five pages of sorry, not sorry, there's a poem scribbled on the back. And so it says... It's, it doesn't, it's called Como Nadie, or Unlike Anyone Else. And it says, Tere, my dear Tere, my beloved Tere, the darling yearned for by my heart. My heart loves only you. I adore you with unparalleled passion. Triumphant over all women. And I'm going to come back to that. <laughs> Love no longer exists for other beings. Beyond you, inside my soul. You suffered last night from your uh, eyes tears rolled down your beloved cheeks. I also suffered. If you would only see how much, exclamation point. How much I suffered, my beloved dear Teresa. Your tears fell drop by drop until filling my heart with pain instead of ending on a high note. Bitterness presided over our dinner. But it was not in vain, my dear Teresa. The pain our being suffered. Well, today I can say without falseness that who I have loved the most, my dear good, is you. I can tell you now honorably, without my lips being stained with lies, that no one I have loved so profoundly, who my soul loves, desires, and breathes. So it's interesting because we have a, um, an octavo, which is an eight, eight line stanza, followed by um, four quatrains, which you know, it tends to be the genre of, of romantic poetry. And so to me, it was wild to see this poem in the atonement letter uh, saying, right, I'm completely devoted to you, but then also saying, um, you are the triumphant over all women. Like what? Mm -hmm. They're living in a commune, right? It's a communal relationship. It's supposed to be this radical idea of where free love, like, which means, you know, unabounding sexual relationships and different configurations of family and kinship are supposed to be happening. But clearly it's a problem, right? Victory touched your palm. Like I'm a prize. You won, <laughs> right? It's, it's, it was so interesting to me to find this because he thinks he's doing like a really good thing, which is writing a love poem, right? In the middle of this letter where he's constantly saying he's made mistakes and he's going to get better. And this is the same guy who's out in the Plaza de Mexicanos, like a few days later, like railing against capitalism, railing against the Catholic Church, railing against the oppression of the worker, right? But he doesn't even have the, the foresight to see like, this love poem is actually injurious. It's a sorry, not sorry. It's a gender capitulation about his privilege as a man, right? And he thinks he's doing something good and he's not. Um, and this is, when I say the mess, like this is the mess, right? This is what we don't get to see in the glorious narrative of the Partido Liberal Mexicano, right? Is that there's a lot of like emotional blundering and slippage, and, but also like romantic souls residing in Baroque language and I'm gonna imitate the British romantics and I'm part of the Latin American poetic Baroque tradition and I imagine myself as a historical subject in this way. And so, you know, in his mind, it's not a sorry, not sorry, but to the feminist eye, right? To the critique of patriarchy, there is a whole lot of wrong going on here. You know, and I just, I think these moments for me, like if my 389 poetry students are watching, right, the form, the quatrain, the romantic form, right, is supposed to signal this kind of undying love and adoration, right, idolation of Teresa, right, uh, darling yearn for my heart, by my heart. Um, but then when we look at the content, it's doing something completely different and it's reproducing masculine heteronormative masculine privilege in ways that, you know, as a feminist reader, I find totally offensive. <laughs> but we need to talk about that. Right, right, right. We can't right, just right. say, like, oh, it's offensive. Like, we need to talk about why, right? And then there's a lesson. Like, 
you know, if, if, if I were teaching this right now, I'd, be, I'd tell my students, like, this is a sorry, not sorry moment. Y'all know what that is, right? There's, and guess what? There's historical continuity. It's still happening. Right? So this is a practice that we see, right, in 1915, 19, uh, mm -hmm. right, that we can see now in, you know, like, an Instagram apology <laughs> from Kanye West, uh, right? <laughs> there are parallels. Yeah, for sure. So there's the relevance to this too, formalistically, like what it's doing. Mm -hmm. right? It's just taking on a different life in a different form and a different, you know, man of color patriarchy, right? If we're gonna talk about Kanye. We're not gonna talk about Kanye. <laughs> that's just a yeah, that's a whole that's, that's not a whole other, other. Yeah, that is a whole other. Yeah. But okay. like, but let's talk about like let's talk about in general to what is mean by these yeah. like sort of the affective reading. Sure, right? Sure. Because you know, you say you use the phrase a couple of times. What you're trying to do is prevent, uh, not prevent, present an affective narrative, right? In yeah. contrast to an histori historiographic one, in yeah. contrast to an ideological one. And I feel like this is an example of what it's mean. But can yeah. you talk a little bit more about sure. what else we learn when that's sort of the lens that you take to this kind of stuff? Sure. And so let me preface the comment by saying that the thing that allows me to read this as a sorry, not sorry, is uh, queer theory's focus on affect, right? And that it comes from bodily presentation, it becomes from tone of voice, it becomes from movement, sound, et cetera, as a kind of um, an intention that uh, we we glean from emotion, emotive posturing, emotive presentation, and thinking about emotion as something that we should track. It's often talked about as ephemera, performance as ephemera, whether we're talking about like Diana Taylor, or Jose Munoz's work, uh, Gayatri Gokunov's uh, second book was very influential. I heard her talk at an NWSA talking about the trace and affect, and I was like, that's what I'm seeing in these things, is these traces of emotion that yield another kind of thought, another kind of record. And so for me, when we do the, the sort of affective reading via queer theory of this poem, um, what we get is a cognitive dissonance between the formalistic qualities of the text, the poetic text, and then the thematic content and the emotion that it's supposed to convey. And it's almost as if the poem is conveying two sets of emotions at once, which is Enrique's intention in saying sorry, and then our understanding of, well, actually, no, this is not sorry, this is further, further injury, right? And so, for me, that's what I, I think has been so powerful and potent about the theories of affect coming out of queer theory that also yoke in the question of, of sexuality, right? Which is to say that uh, when we're talking about affect through a queer theory lens, we're also talking about sexual practice, sexual beliefs, sexual ideas. And somebody asked, said to me when I was writing this book, like, these are not gay people, you can't use queer theory. And my thinking is, yes, and I say this in the intro, like people are gonna be disappointed that I'm not talking about necessarily queer folks per se, right? But I'm talking about queer practices and I'm also talking about queer theory, which is the beautiful contribution of queer theory is that there are universalizing ways that affect has become part of the lexicon in the academy, which allows me to make the argument of emotion and trace of emotion can be a historical formation. And, and that's really where I end up is that if we look at affect, if we look at the emotion, if we look at the trace, we can construct a historical narrative. And that's essentially where I land. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, well, this, I think this is a good pivot to talk a little bit about the Placeros and the reading that you do there, and I'm thinking in particular of that series of images. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk about that, because that's in some ways, you know, I, I was thinking about that I was re as I was reading the book. There's a version of the book in which these are presented as two very different sort of opposing sets of or scenarios, actors, mm -hmm. situations, figures, archives, right? And then there's another version of the book which also makes sense that just says these are the two like two sides of the same coin, right? And I want to ask you about that in general in a minute, but I want to ask you in particular just to talk us through some of the ways in which you take your theory to a reading of these photographs of the placeros in ways that do illuminate some of these ways in which emotion and posture and performance 
are sort of made to be meaningful, or you make them to be meaningful for your reading. Yeah. Um. So I'm going to talk about the the photo sequence that I that I discuss on pages two o four to um two uh ten, which is there's there's one of the things about Leonard Nadell's photographs that really struck me is that everyone talks about the photographs of suffering, of Brasero suffering, right, of guest worker suffering. But when you look at the 2000 plus catalog, there's joy, there's interaction, there's labor, there's um, there's bodily, different kinds of bodily positioning, there's posing, there's movement. And I really started to think about, well, there's a relationship being captured beyond just the photograph, right? There's a relationship with the photographer, there's a relationship amongst and between the people in these images. And so this section that I'm talking about, Nadella has these favorite subjects um, where he'll take a seven to 10 uh, photo or three to four photographic sequence of the same person. And that's not random, right? When somebody takes a multiple shot sequence of the same person, it's like a sonnet sequence, right? When Shakespeare's running his sonnet sequences, like the eight sonnets are to one person. So there's a parallel between right, what Shakespeare is doing with the sonnet sequence and what Nadell is doing with the photographic sequence, which is there is an object of desire, right? And so what I began to think about and understand, and somebody said to me, well, you don't know if they were gay or not in the, in the uh, reader report. And, my thinking is that doesn't matter is that there is something about this individual this gentleman pushing the cookie lettuce box through the fields on a cart on a makeshift cart that is desires that Nadell wants to take eight pictures of him right he takes a picture of him with his foot on a box he takes a picture of him packing lettuce he takes a picture of him stooped over chopping lettuce he takes a picture of him putting a cart where we can actually he's pushing the cart where we can see his face and then let her dominates the scene. We have another picture of him standing on top of a harvester, uh, holding a box of lettuce, humbly posing with the labor that he and his colleagues have produced. And it's a scholar image where he looks so small and dwarfed in comparison to these massive lettuce fields in the background, another panopticon image, right? And then all of these boxes of lettuce in the front. And then he takes this picture where the man is up close and he's posing with his hip forward, directly engaging the camera. This is not accidental. It is, for me, a conversation, an engagement, a set of erotics, a set of desires. You know, I don't think it matters that, you know, maybe Nadal was gay, maybe he wasn't, we'll never know, right? Um, but Nadal lived with these guys, he developed relationships with them, and he had favorite subjects. And we cannot ignore that. And so for me, that's where like affect posing body, like what is what is the gentleman doing? How is his body changing? How is Nadell staging certain photographs as he takes these sequences? And to me, like where queer theory and affect help me is in recognizing being a desiring subject that is, I'm returning the gaze to the camera and also being a desired subject, the camera wants to take a picture of me. And so those relations of looking, those relations of desire, um, I think are really useful uh, for analyzing these texts because they show, and they also mirror or double on this idea that bracetos were desired for their manual labor, they were desired for their bodies. But when we look at what's happening politically and policy-wise in the Salinas Valley, their sexualities are highly policed. They're segregated. They're not only allowed to go into town on Sunday. They're not allowed to look at uh, women or men or children sideways because then there I have this whole section about you know Braceros as potential pedophiles in waiting right we were having a conversation about uh, uh, turfs and feminists earlier before we got started uh, turf feminists before we got started tonight and just how these like logical loops happen in a refusal to engage difference and and the logical loop loop that happens for these these gentlemen right is okay they're they're foreign. Um, they, they, should, they should shut off their sexualities. They should only work in the fields. And if they look sideways at somebody, they're, they're a pedophile, right? So that's one set of desiring relationships. And then we have that that, that is totally at odds with the desiring relationships or those interchanges in the, in the camera lens that we see. Um, and I think that's what queer theory and feminist theory provide for me, is the capacity to look at 
uh, multinodal power relations through a photograph, multinodal power relations by juxtaposing photographs with policy documents and housing ordinances about segregation, with the journals talking about uh, these these gentlemen um, going to dances and interacting with each other, or in Mireya Losa's uh, really wonderful archival research um, in Defiant Bracetos, where she talks about um, you know men reporting uh, noises of sex amongst and between men in the barracks of these of these labor camps. Um, and so there's such a rich world that is opened up through these methods that we get through queer theory and feminism that a straight historical analysis would not provide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, people's lives are rich, people's lives are complicated. Our desire shifts from day to day, minute to minute, you know, month to month. Um, and, and, I, and what I like about the photo sequence is it literally structures time and the continuum of desire in a way we can see, we can see change over time, which is a classic historical argument, right? Because the practice of history is about change over time. Oh, thanks. Um, I do. I sort of want to, come, want to come back to this question of desire, and I want sure. to ask how it relates to questions of intimacy. Because as I was hearing you talk, you were describing desire, what sort of consensual desire, and sort of involuntarily involuntary connections of desire that were forged through the, the photographer and through the camera, through the lens, and things like that. And it was making me think about how, in certain situations. Sort of the positive or the constructive version of this leads to something like intimacy, sure. which is generally a thing to be valued and sought. Um, but there's also like a negative formulation of that, right? Yeah. Um, which is intrus intrusion, uh -huh. which is uh, lack of respect for values or worse still, objection. And so I wanted to ask sort of what you thought about the relationship was between desire and intimacy, and maybe ask if you can. Talk about this both with respect to the Braceros, but also with respect to the Magon brothers, because there you have again, it's like these same sets of issues, but they're mobilized in a really different way. And I think that tension and that comparison is really fascinating. Yeah, uh, this is a really great point. And I, I unfortunately can't find the pages, but for me, the fine line between intimacy as being valued. And the fine line between forced intimacy as intrusive is in the photo sequence that I titled The Mexican Adonis, which is there is a man taking a shower, and it's about six photo sequence. He's taking a shower in a bunkhouse, and he has this beautifully chiseled body. But it's not from bodybuilding like Jacqueline in the 1950s, it's from hard manual labor. And so the sequence starts with a kind of bird's eye view of all of these men taking a shower. But then as time progresses, the dub gets further and further focused on this man and the contours and lines and light and shadow. And he becomes an aesthetic object, but he also becomes an object of desire in, in the way that I read this. And the question of consent was something that somebody challenged me about with this image. And that there are two ideas in feminist legal scholarship, right? Which is one that consent can never truly be achieved. And the other one is that without consent, there's a lack of respect and objection, which is why I titled the section, The Homoerotics of Objection, is because I think there is a fine line that is constantly being crossed and negotiated. I mean, what are you supposed to do? You're a person on a visa, you're far away from your family, you need this money, you have to work, and this white guy with a camera shows up. Right? I'm just trying to imagine right, that moment, right? You're racially subordinated, you're nationally subordinated, you're 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 in this environment that's it's all men, you're completely segregated, shut off and isolated. You may or may not get paid, right? You're pathologized for smoking and drinking and being with prostitutes or being with other men, right? What am I this white guy wants to take my picture? Or maybe he doesn't even tell me. And that's the thing. Like, we will never know if the Mexican Adonis and his beautiful stylized image knew that that picture was taken of him. And if he would have objected, he wasn't probably given the choice. We don't know. And I and I think that that, you know, that fine line between intimacy as shared and mutual and mutually pleasurable, right? Like the men sitting in this photograph, like they're they're at ease. 
right? They're, they're comfortable, but we have to remember the guy behind the camera is a white guy and that's an intrusion. And some folks really took issue with me about this, but I think we have to uh, recognize that there are power dynamics in play uh, that, you know, will, did that gentleman know he was being photographed naked seven times over? My guess is no, and there was no consent involved. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that raises an ethical set of questions about, right, our role as researchers, but then also like when we're working with communities of color that we're not a part of, um, right, how do we respectfully show our, uh, our desire to create knowledge that's not just about extraction, right, because that's where the intimacy goes awry, right, is the objection is about the abstractive part. Right, it's not about the shared part, and I and I think that line between sort of um, extraction and um, shared intimacy is a, is a is an ethical one. Um, does that does that? Yeah, you know that you know that that is that is is really helpful, and it makes me sort of want to go in two different directions. And one is to sort of ask you about another one of these concepts that I think is sort of fractured when you put it in the context of this particular set of images. But the other thing that I really want to make sure that we get to, this is a little bit of sort of my own personal interest, but also this conversation about sort of the ethics of research and what the role is of the scholar who is looking or trying to learn about or make meaning from artifacts that may document non-consentful interactions mm -hmm. or even worse, you know, a trauma. This, the thinking about this comes a lot through archival theory and I did, you know, one of the things that was really interesting to me, thinking about, you know, what I know about the intellectual foundations of your work, and also the sort of core of your first book, I was interested to see that the theories of the archive didn't really have an explicit role in your explication of your method in this book, and yet they were so clearly underlying so many of the choices that you made. Right. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, about how you know, for example, this, you know, someone who we reference all the time when asking questions about how we deal with yeah. um, sort of documents that have to do with violence in city apartment, right? Yeah. You know, it's like, where do you, where does thinking like that about, about these sort of fractured or damaged archives, how does that come into play in this project? So, um, you know, for me, and you know this, but I think for people that don't know this, um, Sophia Hartman, Elaine Scary, Foucault's, uh, Elaine Scary's discipline, and I'm sorry, uh, oh my God, I can see the book cover and I can't remember. It's Foucault's discipline and punish and the body and pain, the body and pain, there it is. Hartman's scenes of subtraction are like, they're like a holy trinity of how to approach, um, how to approach uh, fractured archives and power relations and the trace and just thinking about discursive violence. And so, I think with this, in the first book, I had to sort of show like how I arrived at this theory of engaging with material respectfully, and also like what constitutes epistemic violence when we um, impose a particular reading on something versus allowing the, the documents to dictate how we tell the narrative, which is why I think it's so assimilated the Hartman is so, like, it's part of my heart, it's part of my lifeblood in the way that I think, in the same way that Discipline and Punish and Elaine Scarry's uh, The Body and Pain are, that I don't necessarily talk about it. But so I would say that's a reflection of, like, the difference between a first book and a second book, which is, it's just such a part of how I think that I don't even think about it. Um, but for the student or the person reading, um, it's clearly there. Uh, so to answer answer that first question, um, the second thing that I would say about this idea of fractured archive is that I try and put into practice um, everything that Hartman talks about with the trace about the scene of subjection, the scene of violence as as being potentially voyeuristic and violent in the way that we reproduce that conversation, especially when I talk about lynching in my first book. And then in, in this book, I think more like I'm thinking about the Mexican Adonis sequence. Like it's a form of epistemic violence, but and it's aestheticizing that, right? So it's 
it's turning you know a moment of violence and lack of consent into something beautiful um which you know takes me to like cyanide and ugly feelings and and you know all of these these other really great texts about affect but Herpin's work and another person who's super inspirational to me is tia miles who just wrote this great book about the history of a purse as an archive of the history of an enslaved child and the family's move to freedom. But that is that is a way to take material. Material culture tells us a story. A photograph tells us a story. And when we take a purse as the object of inquiry, right? When we take the throwaway line about a girl being called a Venus, as in um, Venus in two acts in Cynthia Hartman's text, or we take the the, the scenes where um, incidents in the life of a slave girl where uh, Jacobs is exposing her intentions, when we take those bits seriously, we can have a really powerful powerful narrative that speaks against sort of racist forms of, of, of thinking about black and brown subjectivity, about thinking about sexual practice as something as strategic and as pleasurable, thinking about that thin line between intimacy um, and objection, right? Where do we where do we cross? What are the ethics of that? And so, you know, Hartman taught me no line is a throwaway line, leave no stone unturned, right? Foucault taught me about institutions and the institutional structural forms of violence, right? Terry taught me about the body, right? Never forget the body. Even if a person, if in, the, in lieu of speech, the body has a story to tell. Mm -hmm. um, and so those powerful messages are assimilated into the analysis and the method. Um, maybe I'm just being lazy, but. <laughs> no, that was beautiful. That was, I, how are we doing for time? I was just about to I was like, that's an amazing place to stop yeah. because yeah. it's such a beautiful summation of all yeah. of the things that we're going to take about. Yeah. Oh, I got some snaps! <laughs> oh so, I wanted to see where our friends in the physical audience have oh. us. <laughs> Since, yeah, I know you always have brilliant things to say. Oh my god. Oh. You're so... <laughs> I love it. Put me on the... I do have a fucking question. Okay, good job. Good job. <laughs> um, I'm just... I'm actually... The thing that drew me to your book is the title. Okay. Um, when I was really drawn in multiple ways and directions, with your usage of diaspora. Mm -hmm. I think being someone who is Mexican, identifies as Mexican, has like intentionally come to the South to like work alongside black communities and organize with black communities. My experience with diaspora has always been in, in the connotation and referencing of those black communities. And so for me, I was just really in shock of like seeing it being used in reference to Mexican, you know, like, yeah, um, and so I'm just curious about like why the usage of diaspora in this case um, versus something else. Like often there's like migration or just other sure. words that get used. So yeah, sure. For me, the and thank you for your question. Thank you for being here. Um, for me, the the shift to diaspora instead of migration was one to get out of the social science rhetoric of tracking numbers, mm. right? And so it was an intentional choice in that regard. And I and I chose it over transnational, even though diaspora and transnational, I think, have a lot of kinship, is, is that diasporas sort of tend to be, right, sites of continuous movement and circulation. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. like when we talk about the black diaspora, like that's made possible through the violence of the slave trade, mm -hmm. right? And when I'm talking about a Mexican diaspora that shifts gender ideas, I'm thinking about well-trodden paths that are happening over and over again, and there's movement back and forth. Mm -hmm. Just like when we're talking about a Jewish diaspora too, right? There are structural forces that cause those movements and the, the back and forth of, of people, of ideas, and migration. Forced migration, right? And so, whether we're looking at anarchists escaping political persecution or we're talking about um, Bracero's, uh, you know, it's still contracted, but it's forced because of the, the peril that the Mexican economy is in, in in the 1950s or the peril of the Central American economy right now in the 2020s or what's happening in Venezuela, right, with all of these new uh, new migrants, 
they're not new, but that's that's the way that they're talked about. But these are well-worn paths, and that's why I use diaspora. And also because folks are not forgetting about home, right? They're not migrating and saying the end, right? They're still in dialogue with the Mexico de afuera, right? What they've left behind. Like, and I'm thinking about there's a a, a woman at uh, University of Southern California, uh, Michelle. I think it's Rodriguez. She's writing about Zapotec uh, diaspora through homemade videos on YouTube. And the dialogue that happens between Zapotec people in Ventura County and the, the traditional Zapotec pueblos and communities in Oaxaca and the way that they're using YouTube to make a community. But the, those are well-worn paths and that YouTube is the vehicle, right? Where here is in these texts, I'm thinking about like newspapers, government documents, photographs, personal letters, archives, and et cetera. So I use diaspora to talk about well-worn past, to talk about forced migration, to talk about the relationship between the receiving and the sending country, and the way that these folks that I'm writing about, they're Mexican nationals, they're not Mexican Americans. And so I think diaspora is a more useful category because they are Mexican nationals in the United States that are thinking about a return, that in many cases return, um, but that the, that the traces of their lives are still very much present in the way that we think about Mexicanidad. And, and then to go, you know, a little bit further, like, you know, your own work um, in thinking about black and brown solidarity, right, is really important when I think about what just happened in the LA City Council, right, which is, and I talk about this moment in the book where Enrique Flores Magón tries to say that braceros are like, the, the black slaves under Lincoln, right? That's not, that is not an approximation, but he's trying to make a rhetorical argument, right? And I, and I take it apart, right, for its assumptions. But what it is one of the few instances where, that I found that instead of a Mexican expression of anti-black racism, I'm seeing racial solidarity in the column with black folks, column written in 1954, which is really unusual. And then I look at that LA City Council thing and I'm like, yeah, like Mexico's founding principles are on anti-blackness and anti-indigeneity. Of course, that woman said it, the things that she did because she fancies herself as part of the elite and white adjacent. So I'm not surprised. It doesn't mean I'm not disgusted, but like, you know, the solidarity work that you're doing sees parallels and relationships between, you know, the well-worn past of, of Mexican migrants to Georgia that have been coming since the 1980s, right? It's a diaspora too. Um, in the same way that the dispersal of black folks through their forced migration, right, is, is sedimented through the, the institution of slavery. And then, you know, we have those two political communities, you know, in our, in our tenuous coalitions that we're trying to build, right, that you're trying to build. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. Um, so we are going to say goodnight to our friends watching virtually at home. But before we do that, I want to encourage y'all to click this teal button to buy Archiving Mexican Masculinities in Diaspora from Karis Books and More. It really does help us when you purchase your event books from us. So just click that teal button. Um, we also encourage you to tell your academic and public libraries about this book. So it's equally helpful to um, author if you request the book from your library and let your library know that it's something that you're interested in. You can also support the work of Karis Circle. Um, by donating any amount, $1, $5, $10, that all helps us do this work. So thank you for your support. And we are going to say goodnight to all of you. And um, we've got some, some lovely comments coming in, so we'll share those with you. This event will also be put up on our YouTube channel, so if there's folks who you know should be here tonight and didn't get to watch, I hope that um, you'll let them know that uh, this is a great thing for them to watch. So good night to everybody watching at home.